we begin our worship with prayer. Lord God, our merciful Father, we come before you today in awe and wonder as we consider the amazing love that you have shown to sinful, rebellious man through the suffering that your son so patiently endured for us. Fill us here today with an even greater appreciation for the sacrifice which you made for us and for all people. All of the worship, all of the praise that we can give cannot thank you enough for what you have done for us. We ask that you would accept our praise today, that you would increase our faith and our love for you. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. This morning we'll be following the order of service on page 12 and following in the worship supplement. This morning is the first Sunday in Lent, and on this first Sunday our emphasis is on the demonstration of God's power over the devil and the temptations that he brings to us as human beings. We'll see this as God gives his angels charge over us to keep us in all, our, all of our ways, and as Jesus then defeats the temptations of the devil in our place and then comes as our Redeemer. We begin our worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and to serve Him as His dear children. 
but we have disobeyed him and deserved only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all your sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May the Lord give us grace to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and extend your right hand in power to defend us from the foes who would attack us and tear us from you. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. first reading for this weekend is found recorded for us in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the first seven verses. One of the themes for today is going to be the theme of temptation. We're going to see in our gospel reading, Jesus tempted by the devil for 40 days. The Apostle Paul, he also brings out this idea of temptation, the struggles that we face as human <coughs> beings in a world that has fallen, not just with the devil, but our own sinful flesh. And he encourages us in our lives of sanctification, doing the things that God desires for us to do out of love for him. We then read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with the opening verse. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. 
For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Our gospel reading is found recorded in Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus then, as he begins his ministry, goes out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Many times as we read through these verses, we have the assumption that Jesus was tempted by the devil three times, since there are three temptations that are recorded. But in reality, the temptations that took place were throughout those 40 days and much more than just the three that are recorded in the Gospels. We read from Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Here ends our gospel reading. Please rise. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. This morning we join to make confession of our faith in that victory that God has accomplished for us over sin, death, and the power of the devil. We'll be using the words of the Apostles' Creed in the front part of the worship supplement. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, <laughs> suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. This morning, the children are going to sing a hymn for us. They'll invite them to come to the front. If you would like, you can follow along. The words for this hymn are printed also inside your bulletin. Children, if you would, please come forward.
You may remain seated this morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning, the text for our meditation is a familiar section, one that we have learned from the time that we were children, at least for most of us, and one that is extremely important in also understanding the truths of what Christ as our Redeemer has done and accomplished for us. We also see tied into this that theme of temptation as well. We're reading from Genesis chapter 3, beginning with the first verse. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig, leaf, fig, fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. Also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. This is the word of our God. In the name of our Savior Jesus, who is the head crusher, the one announced by God in the Garden of Eden, dear fellow redeemed. A fable or truth? When I was still in seminary, one of the assignments that we were given was to go out and do interviews with other church bodies. We had a list of questions that we were supposed to ask them regarding what their church polity was, basic details about their congregation, etc. 
I was assigned another Lutheran church in the Eau Claire area, the ELCA. And when I went to do the interview, I went through all of the basic questions that we were supposed to ask in order to get a little bit of an idea about the congregation. But before I left, I asked the pastor, what do you do and how do you teach Genesis chapter 3? Do you teach it as myth or do you teach it as real history? And the pastor told me, well, we tell people that it's what might have happened. I was a little bit surprised when I had this pastor tell me that. And I thought, well, this might be just one pastor of this one church. So I called up another pastor in the same denomination and I did an interview with him and I asked him the same question at the end and he gave me the very same line or at least something similar. He said, basically, we don't know if this is history or not, but it's a neat way to try to teach these concepts that we have in the Bible. So in both cases, these two pastors did not believe that the accounts of Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 were actual history. They didn't believe that Adam and Eve were real people and that this was a real temptation that took place. I want, to, I want you to think about the implications of such a view. If the first number of chapters of Genesis are just a fable, if they're just a myth, that was written down by individuals centuries ago in order to give us an idea of how sin might have come into the world, then not only is sin and its roots a myth, but salvation becomes a myth also. The head crusher, the one who's promised in these verses, he also is nothing more than a myth. As we take a look at the verses of Genesis chapter 3, and as we look at the rest of Scripture, we see that that was not the view that was had by the prophets of the Old Testament, by Jesus, or by the apostles of the New Testament. As they looked at the opening chapters of Genesis, they saw real people in real history with real events. And those real people and real events had a real implication on their lives of sin, and the hope that they had of redemption. This morning, as we meditate on the concept of temptation, which we saw in 1 Thessalonians and in Matthew chapter 4, we come back to that idea of temptation once again, the very first temptation. And while we will look at what temptation looks like, we will also take a look at what redemption looks like. The fact that God sees the temptation and the sin that comes into the world, and he sends and promises a savior who would bring victory over sin and temptation in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We pray that the Spirit would bless our study and meditation on these verses of Genesis chapter 3 this morning. Amen. Let's begin with a review of the nature of temptation. Genesis chapter 3, while it is real people and real history and real events, it also does give us a picture of what temptation continues to look like in our own lives today. The tactics that the devil employed in Genesis chapter 3 haven't changed much over the years. He employs the very same tactics in our lives today. Let's start, though, with the word temptation. Temptation can have a lot of different meanings. The Greek word that's used here in the New Testament as well as the Hebrew word that's in the Old Testament can have the idea of testing in order to see if it will survive, testing to see if it is good or valuable. But it also has a negative idea, and that idea of temptation is to entice into sin, to cause someone to do what God doesn't want them to do. And that's the definition that we'll be looking at today when we consider the nature of temptation. In the opening verses of Genesis chapter 3, Moses introduces us to a very important individual. We're told in the opening verse of our text, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. But the serpent, we think of snakes, the serpent has an interesting characteristic here in Genesis chapter 3. He goes on and he tells us that the serpent said to the woman. 
This serpent wasn't just any serpent. This was a talking serpent. He said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Well, before we go too far, we need to talk a little bit about the serpent. What is this serpent that was talking to Eve in the midst of the garden? And strikingly, why was Eve not surprised? Well, the rest of the New Testament, it tells us who it is that we're looking at. Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, reflects back on this opening chapter in the history of mankind and tells us that the serpent of old, of Genesis chapter 3, is the great dragon called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. The Apostle John made the connection between the serpent of Genesis chapter 3 and the deceiver, the devil. Jesus said the very same thing in John 8, chapter, or chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus calls the devil a murderer from the beginning and the father of lies, referring back to Genesis chapter 3. So the New Testament has identified this serpent of Genesis as none other than a fallen angel, the devil, or Satan. Well, look at the devil's intent. Fallen from the grace of God because of his rebellion against God, the devil is out for destruction, for devastation, for corruption of that perfect world that God made. And as we take a look at the characteristics of the devil or the serpent in Genesis chapter 3, we see that one of those is that he is deceptive. Notice his opening question to Eve in verse 1. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? It seems like an innocuous, very basic, very simple non-dangerous question, doesn't it? The serpent simply asks a question. He wants to gain some information. Has God really said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? I want you to notice what the devil did, though. Not only does he question Eve, but he throws in a mistruth. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? That actually wasn't what God said, was it? And, and Eve realizes this. She responds to the devil in verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it. But the seed of doubt has been planted. And you'll notice that what Eve goes on to say isn't exactly what God said. Eve says, but of the fruit of the, fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Simply by asking a question, the devil has sowed the seed of doubt. Doubt about the goodness of God. Doubt about what God actually said. That doubt is what the devil brought into the mind of Eve. And now the devil continues on, and now he comes forward with a blatant, outright lie. In verse 4 of our text, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. And here's the rationale behind it. God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The devil goes from a simple question sowing the seed of doubt, as God forbid all of the trees of the garden, to a flat-out lie, you shall not die. And once again, he sows the seed of doubt. He points Eve back to the goodness of God and causes her to question whether God's forbidding them to eat of that one particular tree was because he was really concerned about them or whether he was concerned about himself. The devil says, God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. God doesn't want that, which to some degree was true, wasn't it? What the devil said was partially true. God didn't want them to eat of the tree. And yes, their eyes would be opened, knowing good and evil when they ate. But the devil makes it look good. 
He makes it look enticing. He makes it look as if God is withholding something from Adam and Eve by forbidding them to eat of that tree. He tries to highlight the positive or to make a positive where there is no positive. The Bible tells us that the devil deceived Eve into sinning. In fact, Eve even admits this when the Lord comes into the garden. She says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Apostle Paul reinforces this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul says, the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. It's an important characteristic, and it is very much tied to the idea of temptation. That many times temptations are not obvious, they're subtle. The devil is deceptive, and the world around us also gets us to make it look like the things that are forbidden by God are actually wonderful gifts that God is keeping from us as human beings. We'll also notice that the devil is persuasive. Adam wasn't deceived, and this is interesting. Eve was deceived, but Adam was not, but he still fell into sin. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, when Paul recounts the fall into sin here from Genesis chapter 3, Adam cle or Paul clearly says, Adam was not deceived. In other words, Adam knew it was wrong. Remember, it was God who had spoken to Adam about the tree. Adam had passed that information on to Eve. You can understand why Eve might have been deceived. You can also understand why Adam wouldn't have been deceived. He knew exactly what God had said. And yet, he still ate, didn't he? Even though he wasn't deceived in the same way that Eve was, he decided to go against what God had commanded and to eat of the fruit of the tree just as his wife did. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. The burden for the fall into sin didn't fall on the shoulder of Eve, but rather on the shoulder of Adam, who was the one who was not deceived. It was because of Adam's sin that sin came into the world. Even though the woman was deceived, it was Adam who disregarded the very clear command of God and fell into sin. As a result, there are consequences, dire consequences, not only for Adam and for Eve, but for the serpent, for the devil, and even for the world in which we live. Those consequences of giving in to temptation or being enticed into sin are deadly not only for ourselves, but also for the people around us. Notice in the resulting verses the curses that are leveled against all of the different parties as a result of the fall into sin. The serpent is cursed in verse 14 of our text. Verse 14, the Lord says to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. There was a curse that was leveled against the serpent, the vehicle, the means by which Satan brought the temptation to Eve. We don't know all the details, but we know that there was a curse that was felt by this particular animal as a result of being used by the devil. There's a second curse. The devil himself is cursed in verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The, ser the serpent was cursed but also the devil was cursed, the one who was actually carrying out the temptation. He said, you will have your head crushed by the one who would be a descendant of Eve. Jesus is the one who is predicted here, the one who would come as the crusher of the head of Satan. But there's more curses that are given. We have curses that are found in verses 16 and then 17 through 19. The woman, she also had curses that impacted her. In verse 16, the Lord says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. 
Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And then to Adam and to the earth itself there's a curse. Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. God had told Adam, in the day that you eat of that tree, you will surely die. In Hebrew, it's literally dying, you will die. The process of death would begin. Adam and Eve died spiritually on that day. They were separated from God. But there was another death that was also pointed to in these verses, and that was the physical death that Adam and Eve, as well as the rest of humanity, would also deal with. Dust you are, and to dust you will return. This last week, as we began the Lenten season, we were reminded of those verses from Genesis chapter 3 with Ash Wednesday. Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. This was the consequence of rebellion against God of heeding the temptation of the devil. Not only had they died spiritually and been separated from God, but they would also die physically. And apart from a redeemer, that spiritual and physical death would also mean eternal death. But this wasn't what God had in mind for humanity. It wasn't what God desired for humanity. That perfect world that he had created, he still desired for humanity to have a part in that perfect world. And so in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God promises to make things right. To right the ship that was sinking as a result of sin, he would send one who would come to bring redemption. Not only do we see the nature of temptation and how the devil works even in our own lives, but we also see God describing the nature of redemption. In these verses, God promises redemption to sinful mankind. And what we have in Genesis 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel, is what many theologians have called the proto-evangel, the first gospel. This is the very first message of redemption, salvation that God gives to humanity after the fall into sin. And it's right there on that very same day as he's cursing the serpent, as he's cursing the devil, as he's describing the curse that will fall on man and woman and on the earth which we inhabit. God says, I am going to send one, the seed of the woman, who will crush the head of the serpent. Eve might have thought when the serpent came up to her on that day and asked her that simple question, has God really said that she had a new friend? But the devil wasn't her friend. The devil wasn't Adam's friend. And that friendship, or what looked like friendship, would be torn apart, the Lord says. I will put enmity between you and the woman. There will be a change that will take place in that relationship, you will realize that the devil is not your friend, that he is actually your enemy. The Lord says that he would send the Savior and the Savior would bruise the serpent's head. Literally, this is an intensive verb form. It means crush. He will crush your head and you will crush his heel. This promise that God makes in the garden was fulfilled in Jesus. Think back to our gospel reading from earlier in Matthew chapter 4. We're told that as Jesus begins his ministry, he goes out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. We had three examples in that reading. The devil comes with a temptation, and how does the Lord respond? It is written. The devil comes back with another temptation. How does Jesus respond? It is written. 
the devil comes back with another temptation. And how does Jesus respond? It is written. And just as here in Genesis chapter 3, you may have noticed that in Matthew chapter 4, once again, the devil takes things out of context, doesn't he? He even quotes from the scriptures. He says, throw yourself down off the pinnacle of the temple because the Bible says he will give his angels charge over you. Nothing's going to happen to you. You're the Messiah. But he takes those things out of context in order to twist the words of God for his own meaning, for his own purpose. The devil has the same purpose still today. Each one of those temptations that Jesus faced, he faced by going back to the word of God. Now let me ask you a question. When you face temptation, how often do you go back to God's word? Not as often as we should. The nature of temptation is that it is deceiving, it is deceptive, it is persuasive. And the way that we respond to the temptations of the world are the same way in which Jesus overcame them through the word of God. It's the word of God that reveals how ugly sin is and the reality of the consequences that sin brings. It is the word of God that reminds us that there is hope for us that's not found in our own power or strength, but rather in the strength of Jesus in the victory that he has brought, brought for each one of us. Jesus endured those temptations. And in those 40 days, we see a picture of the whole life of Jesus. Every temptation that Jesus ever faced, he defeated with flying colors. There wasn't a single time where Jesus gave in to sin. And Jesus did that on your behalf and on mine. He lived the perfect life that we were unable to live. And by his grace, he imputes that righteousness to us by faith. But Jesus not only lived a perfect life and endured and faced and defeated temptation perfectly throughout his life, not only did he do what we could not do, Paul tells us that he also did something else. Again, in Romans chapter 5, we're told, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, going back to Adam, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. That one act of righteousness, which Paul refers to in Romans, is not the 40 days in the wilderness. It's not the 33 years of Jesus' life as he lived a perfect life for us, but it was rather Good Friday when Jesus gave his life for ours and paid the debt of our sin by dying in our place. That was the perfect act of righteousness, the one act of righteousness which God foretold in Genesis chapter 3 when Jesus would come and crush the head of the serpent. Adam sinned. And as a result of his sin, he brought sin and condemnation into the world. Jesus, on the other hand, the second Adam, obeyed, even to the point of death. And as a result, he brings redemption, life, salvation for those who face temptation and even have a sinful nature. Jesus has won the victory over sin and over temptation through his perfect life and through his substitutionary death in our place. The question might be, if Jesus has won the victory over sin and temptation, then why do we need to continue to endure and stand against temptation in our own lives? Paul again answers in Romans 6, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not, Paul says. You were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. We thank God that as we begin this Lenten season, we are reminded of the reality of temptation, that the account of Genesis chapters 1, 2, 3, and the rest of Genesis is real history, that Adam and Eve were real people, that they faced a real temptation from the devil in the form of a serpent. And that, that temptation brought sin and its consequences into the world. 
but we're also reminded of the nature of God's redemption. And we thank God that he has sent his son who crushed the head of the serpent through his death on the cross and has given us the victory. May we glorify God with our bodies as we continue to face temptations in this life, knowing that ultimately Jesus has won the victory over the devil for us and for all people through faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
please rise for prayer. O oh, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us a high priest, Jesus Christ, who knows our infirmities, since he bore them, and who understands our trials and troubles, since he endured them. All praise to you for the love that you have shown to us through your Son. O Jesus, Lamb of God, you were slain as a sacrifice for the sins of the world and have become the author of salvation for all who trust in you. Give us such faith and trust that we, listening to your voice, may find the true joy of conforming our wills to your holy will. If we find ourselves in temptations, deliver us by your power and save us from all evil. Help us also to wrestle daily against the powers of darkness which are present in every circumstance of our lives. Overthrow Satan, our evil foe, and every assault upon our souls. Make us strong in you and by your example. Show us the victorious power of your word. O oh Lord, let your blessing rest upon our homes. Give to parents wisdom and grace to be true followers of him who is the light of the world so by their manner of living, they might be worthy examples for their children. Bless our country and those in every office and calling that they might lead this nation in a way that is pleasing to you. For those among us who are afflicted with suffering or pain, grant that they might see your gentle hand of guiding love in whatever troubles them. For those who sorrow, give the comfort of your promises. For those who are in need, show yourself the source of all good. If any are dying, give them the confidence that through this earthly body, we, all, we have the hope of a new glorious life in Christ and the promise of a glorious resurrection when he returns again. Dear Father, now give your angels charge over us and all your people. Minister to their salvation and bring them safely through this world to the eternal kingdom which you have prepared for those who place their trust alone in your Son. It is in the name of Jesus we ask all of this, and in his name in which we also join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the blessing and promise of our triune God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll close our service with the singing of the final hymn, which is found inside the bulletin this morning. It's printed at the end of the sermon text inside your bulletin. Uh -oh.